This is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with Villa. Hello. Hello, and thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you, and for folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? All right, so my name is Villa, as we've already cleared, and I'm a, an MVP, a data platform MVP from Sweden. I just became a data platform MVP like a couple of months ago, and I work with a company called XOB, bit hard to pronounce, but E-X-O-B-E dot mm-hmm. com. And uh, we are basically, we are a consultant firm. We're 50 people and we only work with the Microsoft Cloud. So nothing else. Okay. We, we just focus on that. And that's what I've been doing for six years now, I think. So, so uh, yeah, that's pretty much well, my... my was, it, was the company born in the cloud? Was it started with yes. the, just the cloud? Okay, that's very yeah, cool. Exactly. We're, yeah. we're starting to see more and more of the like, rapid growth of companies that didn't move from the on-prem world over into the cloud, but actually started in the cloud. So it's, yeah. So, I there's, so the, there's probably a lot of research out there on that, <laughs> the differences between that, but yeah. Probably. I mean, that, that was even our like catch catchphrase. We, we had that on all our PowerPoints before, like we were born in the cloud. Yeah. And uh, uh, XOB is actually mer- a merge of two companies and the company where I, well, where I were employed before that merged into this, we are the one who had the catchphrase born in the, in the cloud. And mm-hmm. we were actually um, founded by three people where two of them were MVPs. So that's also kind of how I stumbled upon the term MVP and really started to understand like, what is this community all about? And what is this program? And oh, so those are the kind of people who stand up there up on stage on, on these different events and you know well, inform me about all these cool stuff. Well, now that you've brought that up, so how would you define what an MVP is? Oh, my definition of an MVP. I think it's someone who is uh, very passionate about sharing your your knowledge to others. And that's really the key point. And I, I want to start with that because it has more to do with your willingness to share what you know rather than knowing everything in the field. Because there are a ton of people out there who knows more than I do in, in multiple uh, areas in which, you know, where I am an MVP. But I, I think... I think for me, it's, it's more about the, the shareability. Like you, you want to be up on stage. You want to tell the world about the, all this cool stuff. And you don't, really, you don't really fear that people will take this and, and make it their own and just you know, leave you behind. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, all these discussions about you know, intellectual property and you have, to, you have to keep everything so well guarded. My mindset is more like there's enough. And there's even, even too much, like even if I shared everything I know, even if I kept having educations every day, people would still be you know, oblivious to all the things that there is. So, right. so, yeah. so the issue isn't to keep everything, to, to have something. The issue is that I can't share enough, really. And I think that's, that, that's for me, is, is the mindset of, an, of a typical MVP. You know, there were conversations when I became an MVP over a decade ago, there were a lot of discussions of, uh, uh, and it was true, it was happening, a lot of plagiarism by, you know, like uh, just outright, and I think it's still a problem from time to time where people will just steal blog content, Mm. cut and paste and put their name at the top of it. You don't see it as often as you used to, the tools are better to identify that. And there was a lot, but there was a lot of fear of, I saw fellow MVPs that were going after people that properly cited their work. So their, the citations were mm-hmm. correct. They weren't plagiarizing. They were saying like, Ville said this and here, and there's a link to the blog post or the article that you wrote in the blog post. And there were and MVPs still. that were going after those people saying, you didn't have permission to, to add that. And like, ah. Like that, you know. Okay, so so that to me that doesn't really make sense it does. It doesn't that, make any exactly, sense if it's properly yeah, exactly. cited. I understand. Yeah, it, sure, sure. If they don't put the citation in place and claim it as their own, that's a different argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, of course. I mean, if you yeah, if you steal something from someone else and don't give them credit, and you get credited for for that work that you stole, yeah, then I would also think think that's a that's a bit of an issue. But 
like for, for me, the reason I put stuff out on, on GitHub or on my blog or on YouTube, the reason is to spread awareness and spread information. So I want people to copy those things. Like, like usually when I do a blog post, it's, it's usually about some sample code or I'm doing a Power BI piece and I'm putting together some, together some, some DAX code, some formulas to, yep. But then since I'm doing that for the blog post, I end up with a report anyway. So I usually just save that report and, and put it up on GitHub as well. So anyone can download it because I mean, at the end of the day, even if, if, if it's there and someone can improve upon that, then that's even better. And right. I don't really care if, if people will steal those, those things. And I think for, for those simpler things, like I, I've made this super simple uh, calendar template that mm -hmm. pretty much has any every metadata that you can imagine about a, a date. So mm -hmm. instead of just for me you, uh, to recreate a calendar table each time I'm doing a new report, I can just copy and paste this code and then I have everything like what is the date, what is the year, what is the quarter, what is the day of the week and what's that? What's, what's the name of that day of the week and, and everything that I might need in the report later on. And, and that code, I mean, I didn't invent that code so, so I, so I figured that that's not something you can steal from me. I didn't, right. I didn't come up with the concept, right? But but so, I love. So those... you know, I think it's a high compliment if you do a detailed walk through a blog post, for example, and then somebody has gone up, and this has happened to me several times in the past, mm -hmm. where they actually somebody will go into a a blog post or a video where they're walking through the steps that I provided and they're doing, right. and, and I did this and I w did this one a different way. And like, I, like that's yeah. fantastic. That's yeah, exactly. in fact, just a suggestion to anybody out there that is interested in maybe becoming an MVP is, is that's a great way to raise your level of visibility with MVPs yes. and to make connections yeah. is provide that feedback to, to do kind of a, your own walkthrough of following those steps and providing your deployment experience of that thing, of that piece of code, of that best practice that was shared out there. And then again, the proper citations, yes. notify, do a, do a track back, you know, message to the blog post of the, of the MVP. That's, that's the kind of interaction that I love to see that happen. Yeah. And I think, I think, <laughs> Before this discussion, I would say 100% of the people, the MVPs, <laughs> would be honored if someone made like a video of, of something they created and showed that, wow, this was so cool and I, I followed these steps, but I did this slightly diff differently. Because that's, in my opinion, that's, that's like proof that so someone is actually getting value out of what I'm doing. And right. that's also, I think, at least important for, for, for someone like me. Like you, you do want to have some kind of appreciation for the work you put in. <laughs> right. Well, it's, you know, I, so I look at it, like I started my blog a uh, long time ago, my, my blog, the one that I'm currently on with its name and domain started in 2004. Mm -hmm. So it's been, been a while. It's been a, um, around. And, and so I'm always, uh, you know, grateful to get feedback on, on things and comments from people and things that are out there. But uh, I, I don't have the, a lot of that kind of interaction on my blog, but I will see it in other places i'll i'll see that um uh, you know a, a story a customer story an example that i or, or, a, or an article get referenced in somebody's presentation i'll be sitting at a community event like a sharepoint saturday uh for example mm -hmm. and somebody will mention and have a link to something i'm, I'm like wow that's really cool to, to go and see that you get that little extra buzz from from yep. giving back but but ultimately, I started my blog as more of a way, it's great that other people are finding use, but I did it more of a, to kind of extend the, my, the memory capability, extend my brain, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. capture my yeah. own learning. So I'm constantly going back and referencing, like, what did I find out about this? And like, oh, yeah, I documented that. I blogged on this, this point, and I'll go back and check my own research into topics. Yep. That's the yeah. way I kind of look like, at it. Like, how did I do this? And yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like before I before I started blogging, since Power BI is kind of like a passion for me, I would use it to analyze anything like my vacational sleep. Uh, I, I have a, an Apple Watch and I'm tracking my sleep schedule on it. So I managed to, to export all the data and then play around with that and mm -hmm. just have fun with it. Right? And, and I did that for all kinds of stuff. So I, I had all these reports just laying locally on my computer with stuff that I've, I've made but I was the only one who saw it. So, so it became 
became became kind of like a natural thing to also you know put that on the blog and and expose that if not for for everyone else but at least for myself because I don't yeah. always have my own computer with me, so I wouldn't always have access to these files. Now, right. these days, I, I could just put it in a OneDrive folder, but it's easier to just reach out on my blog, especially when it comes to you know text and documentation. It's it's one thing to open the report and then, hmm, where did I put this? And and maybe I don't have comments in the code that way that you would put in a blog. So, yeah, it, it's I think there's always there's something that uh, you know everyone really wants to nerd out about around the, the, the data. I've, I have two of my kids, one that is in healthcare and is in the analytics space. And so um, she frequently is, you know, she's becoming an expert in Power BI and she's used other statistical analysis tools. I've got a son who's about to finish his degree in, what is it? It's uh, the atmospheric sciences, his undergrad. So he's, uh, we call him weather boy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but he's also, he's learned uh, some R and Python and started to do some yep. other things, uh, you know, around that me, I mean, that weather data, healthcare data, not interesting whatsoever. And I'm just like, I, I can't really geek out about that. No, I'm a music collector. Yep. And like, if they're, if Spotify had an open API, maybe they do. I just haven't explored it. I, I, I got some news for go, you, yeah. Do finish they? Finish that thought. Yeah, finish Ooh, that thought and I'll, and I'll tell you. So I have, there's like collectors, there's different tools and things that are out there that I have, I'm, I've been cataloging all of my music. I would love to be able to go in and take my catalog of music and be able to look at data of my music consumption because Spotify is my primary streaming tool set, but also just public data about uh, music data in it. So that, for example... Uh, end of year, you know, how Spotify does the end of year statistics on your music listening. So I am, I am 0.005% of listeners of Duran Duran in the world. So okay. I'm like one, I listen to Duran Duran most than uh, more than just about anybody alive. <laughs> yeah. And there's not a day that goes by that I'm not listening to some Duran Duran songs, which those that are not Duran Duran fans, then, you know, too bad for you, your unhappy life. But yeah, anyway, um, but it's, uh, I would love to be able to go in and slice and dice that data uh, and, and look at my, my collection versus the, the, the data and what's being used for. Yeah. And uh, so, it'd just be fascinating. So actually, I, I had kind of like the same thought at you. If you want to, I, I can share my screen and show you something yeah, sure. from my blog. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I had the kind of like the same idea that upcoming, the upcoming new year and Spotify would said, like, this is the music that you've been listening to the most. And so in November, I, I went into the Spotify website. Mm -hmm. I, get, I went into my account and I saw that you can download all your personal data, like because of GDPR, that you, you can always do that, right? Sure. So I just uh, I just ordered my my data, and uh, within a couple of hours, they sent me a, a zip file with all the JSON files of all my streaming history and all my playlists and and everything they had on me. And so I used that for this particular report, but I also started to research the research, and I found an API. So they do actually allow you to to ask questions about your streaming history and special artists and. Uh, well, uh, albums and and everything like wow. And I figured, uh, and I figured first like maybe they have information on which country does the artist reside from and that sort yeah. of information because that makes sense. But I found they have so much more. Like they actually uh, analyze the songs and they give it a score for for example for energy and danceability and stuff like that. Hmm. So based on the yeah, based on the content of the of the song, they can actually like determine this is this is an easy song to dance with or to dance to and uh, combined with like the country from from where the artist resides as well as how much energy it is, you can really ask questions to the API and get a, a very good recommendation list. Well, well that's why you know they have you know, the platform like this, I mean, this is fascinating to me because like the, the AI that's in place um, yeah. to suggest songs and put together lists based on your history. And that's why it is important when I, when you come across a song within a playlist like that, that you just don't like, not just to skip, 
but to actually do a thumbs down so that it learns why it, it'll it'll pick up like your listening time yep. in fact you skipped it but something if you really dislike it you know the thumbs down so that it so okay that's not a face it's constantly looking at the listening patterns and creating and, and pulling from the the, the list and, and and that's why it's able to do like by genre, like I listen to yeah. three or four distinct genres and it puts together very distinctive playlists around each one of those. So it's, yeah, it, it, so I didn't realize yeah. that it had that stuff that's open, but it makes sense that it's out there. Yeah, yeah it, it really does. Yeah. So uh, if you if you want to, you can allow me to share, to share my screen and I'll show you the, because I actually, I actually made two things out of this blog post. First of all, I just, well, three things. I, I made the blog post itself. So you can read about like my insights that I made on the report. I also made a link to my GitHub site. So you can download the template, download your own Spotify data and simply just tell Power BI which, which folder did you put the JSON files in and it's gonna create this report uh, for you, which is, which is gonna go back about 12 months. See, and are you I able will... to, are you able to share yet? Uh, you yes, should. yes, now right. I am. There, now I am. there we go. So, and you can also, click here to actually play around with my, my report. So here using Power BI for your Spotify data from last November, uh, I, I made the graphical interface look like the Spotify player mm -hmm. <laughs> to kind of get this look and feel. And uh, if, you, if we scroll down, it's, it's about how I created it and what, what the different pages are actually representing. But if we go up here, all the way to the top. You know, I should, let me frame this for everybody watching. Like, I didn't know that he blogged about this. Like that, that there, this was not a setup at all. This, this, yeah, like you had, right, right. You had no idea that I nope. was a music collector and and uh, nope. and fan around this. But uh, you know, honestly, I didn't know that he did all this. So anyway, sorry. Continue. <laughs> it was just happened to be a very yeah. good coincidence, right? So uh, here, here you can download the report for you, for yourself. And at the bottom of this blog post, I'm having some instruction on how you can connect your to your own data. But if you click here. You can actually look at my data and my report live in in uh, in this web browser. So first of all, I have 28 playlists on Spotify, and they have 3,500 tracks in them. However, there are 2,945 unique tracks because I mm -hmm. tend to to you know put right. a lot of duplicates in them, <laughs> and then some some like overview information, right? And then if we go to playlist, you can drill down into your playlist. Like I can see the different ones here. How many followers do I have? How many tracks are them? How many mm -hmm. distinct albums and distinct artists do I have? But if we go the other way around, I can actually look at like this in flames only for the week is apparently in three playlists and it's these three. So it's it's all also like a cleanup tool for me to mm -hmm. go through, through my playlists and kind of clear out what I don't want to have in here. And what you said about streaming history, mm -hmm. I've created this view. So basically you get some KPIs up here. I've streamed 27,000 tracks in total for this year, which amounts for about three and a half thousand hours. I tend to have Spotify on <laughs> during all the way work days. So, so that might be one of the reasons. And I also shared at this point, I shared my, my account with my wife. So half of this is probably hers. Like Sam Smith is yeah. not really mine, <laughs> but but if sure, I click on, for sure, example, uh -huh. yeah, sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if I could click on, for example, Equilibrium, I get a list of uh, uh, all the tracks that I've been listening to from them and how many times have I played them and how many hours have I played this specific uh, music. But now it also creates this accumulated graph. So when, when we look here, you can see that I had kind of like a, like a time when I didn't listen that much to them. But when it goes steep, it means that I, I, I listened a lot to uh, mm -hmm. this this artist, and by the time of the 14th of May last year, I had listened 577 times and 101 hours, and then it continues. So you can really d dive into your own data like this. And also, uh, if we make this a bit bigger, when during the hours of the day did I listen to this art mm -hmm. artist the most? Like, uh, I, I listened to it 60 times at 2100 hours. But we can also do it the other way around, of course. This is Power BI. So if I click on, on that one, this uh, will instead show me what kind of songs did I most listen to during, well, oh, 9 p.m. Yeah, yeah. In, in the hour. Yeah. Why so am I what, going to falling asleep so angry every night? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And this would be the reason. Maybe yeah. not so much equilibrium <laughs> at night, maybe more like 
slow music maybe yeah and then i made this death metal that's right <laughs> <laughs> i actually usually put my daughter to sleep using using equilibrium so and she likes it she likes it yeah. well i noticed by the way on the uh, the, the last uh, uh list that you had there you had the band oh. papa roach that's a uh from oh. where i'm i so northern california band that uh ah, was from the era right. when i was uh, the lead singer of an alt rock band in in uh in Northern California, and and so we never wow. we never played with Papa Roach, but they were playing live all over uh, all over California at the time back in the early nineties. That's but, yeah. anyway. <laughs> that's also something that we didn't really know. Uh, I should say that we didn't um, uh, talk about before, and it sort of just happened. Yeah. So, yeah. So this, that, uh, this is that's fantastic. Like history. history. Well, now, this is what do you th- what do you think is under weird insight though? Uh, the end I have of... no idea. So I went a bit bananas with this, but so I found out I've changed track 4,300 times before 30 seconds. Oh, I have okay. listened to yeah. 289 so- tracks where the name is more than 50 characters long. Super weird, but then I guess something. <laughs> that is a weird insight. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? And then what is my favorite track based on the day of the week? And my most favorite one is I found a calculator down here which tells you how many calories you burn by listening to music so how much calories does it take for your brain to to make sound into you know something that you can actually understand and you can use this what if parameter to say how much you weight and if if you weight 101 kilos then this you would have burned for 462,000 calories which is about equivalent to 4,600 apples just by listening to music <laughs> All great data. That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. There's a. It would be fun to go in and put something like that that together. Well, that's the thing of it. When you have the, the data set and start going and looking at those differences, even looking at like what's the calorie burn per genre that you're listening to, and yep. yeah, and, and you could look at something like, well, how many cal for the same genre? How many calories am I burning at different times during over the course of the day? Yeah, uh, sure. Do I you know, burn more or less of listening to this? So you can optimize your music listening to burn the most calories and be like, <laughs> oh, oh, it's three o'clock. I need to switch genres, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oof, getting a bit fat here. Maybe I should yeah. switch to more. But, but more, all this, you know, what's, this is fascinating because it's like uh, what uh, I, I uh, like in business school in the late 90s, I was dreading going through and taking my stats class. And yeah. it ended up being one of my favorite classes during my during grad school, because it was less about the calculation, the technical, like what you're actually doing, and was more about the context, the use of the st- statistical analysis, and the business application of those things. Mm-hmm. And, and so this shows while we're talking about some things like these weird stats, it may not be you know, relevant to anything around this. But now you you start to understand the importance of going in and looking at data for like product management. Why is it that all of the leading companies, uh, you know, Microsoft is a great example, started hiring data scientists and, you know, for every single product team is starting to look at what are the usage patterns? What are we seeing? Why are some new features driving engagement more than others and how we can prioritize some of the different, like what we focus on, not just because of selling net new licenses, but increasing engagement and adoption of of the tools and systems. So you can make truly planned, intelligent decisions about what you go and build. Yeah, it's definitely, because actually that's actually kind of how I started my MVP journey. I, I, I decided I want to become an MVP. And at that point I was actually working more uh, towards adoption and how to use the different services in, in uh, Microsoft 365. And so I figured I'm, I'm going to become an Office and Apps MVP. And then I worked for that for a while, but then I always fell back on Power BI, right? On, on the Power Platform. Uh, yeah. So I would drive these adoption, adoption campaigns, but I would also always use Power BI to determine which users to focus on and, and uh, which groups to focus on and what to do with this. And eventually I decided that like everyone is becoming an Office and Apps MVP. Everyone is a Teams MVP. So I'm going to go with a Power Platform MVP. Yeah. And I didn't really read up on that because there's no such thing as a Power Platform MVP. It turns out that right. business yeah, application... Technically, well, technically, yeah, exactly. it's under the, the focus area of, of uh, 
you know, of data business platform. application. Yeah, business yeah, yeah. applications, data platform and business application. There are yes. some on either side of that. Either one, you can still refer to yourself as a power platform MVP, and that's okay yeah, too. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is okay. It's just that when I started to, you know, make all these contributions with that you have to do to become an MVP, then I kind of split them, split them up between Power Apps, Power Automate, and Power BI, and some even some Power Virtual Agents. And then when I started to fill them in, in the website, I realized that hmm, now I have like 50-50 and it's not enough for either of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. And then I decided, uh, I actually became a, a fast track recognized solution ar architect. It was last year, uh, the first time. And then I decided I'll, I'll go ahead and just focus on Power BI. And then this year I finally made it and became it's, a data platform MVP. It's a good area. To, it's a good focus. I know quite a few that are within that space. It's a, so you're a good company over there as well. Yep. I, well, Vila, I, I've noticed. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a fun area. Well, well, uh, I think, you know, thank you for taking the time and, and going deep dive into on the music <laughs> side. I, I could geek out for hours on the music and the analysis side. Now I need to go take a look at your blog post. I need to go build that for myself. <laughs> Um, so my wife, another side project to take me away from, <laughs> you know, giving my wife attention, but anyway, it, it happens, uh, it happens. but Billy, I really uh, appreciate your time for people that want to find out more about you or connect with you. What are the best ways to reach you? Uh, the best way would be on either LinkedIn or Twitter. So on LinkedIn, Ville Gullstrand and on uh, Twitter, it's Ville Seke Viking and I don't know. Do you do you post these on? I will post all the links. It'll yeah. be in YouTube. It'll be on the blog as well. So you'll have everything. Perfect. So you can scroll down, people, and you can find all the links there. But... Nice, nice. And thank you so much for having me. It was great meeting you, and hopefully see you next year at the uh, MVP Summit if it happens in person. Like yeah, I hope, yeah, I hope. I hope. I know. I know. <laughs> hey, well, thanks a lot for your time. We'll talk to you soon. Wow.